Hello, ladies and gentlemen. What rapt and silent attention we will now have to earn it. Very warm welcome to all of you tonight. I'm Anne McElvoy, and it's my great pleasure to be chairing Matthew Taylor's annual RSA Chief Executives Lecture this evening. Just before we begin the usual housekeeping, which I'm sure you're all used to, but if you could switch your mobiles to proper silent, we would be very grateful. We'd like to hear from you later, but not so much from your phone. Uh, we're filming this evening's event and streaming live over the web. So welcome also to those of you joining us online from the world outside. If you would like to tweet about this, please do so. The hashtag is power to create one word. Well, it's a particularly significant annual lecture for Matthew here this year. Some of you will know that over recent months, the organization has been developing some new thinking about its role and its central mission and the impact that it has in the world. And I think that Matthew's words tonight are going to invite us to consider that, both in the context of the RSA and more generally in the society around us. He will be presenting some of the first fruits of the process and revealing the ideas that underlie it and will guide the RSA's program of work in the future. So I'm sure he'd very much like to hear your responses and thoughts to that. Uh, I've worked with Matthew a lot in many incarnations. Some of you might hear us squabbling on the moral maze on occasion. Get a week off this week for good behaviour by coming to do this. Um, one of the things that I've always admired about Matthew, although we've often had points of difference, is that he really isn't afraid of taking on the big subjects and the big ideas and trying to apply them to the world we live in in practical steps as well as big thoughts and I think this is no exception. Looking at creativity at the moment seems to me to be an excellent choice, an under-discussed subject and an under-discussed under -discussed approach and I was just sort of leafing around in my ancient files on the subject today and found this quote from Goethe, if you treat an individual as he is he said, he will remain how he is. If you treat him as if he were what he ought to be, he will become what he ought to be and what he could be. I think that's a very good guideline for this evening's discussions. We might hear something more along those lines for the 21st century as opposed to the end of the 18th. So please, without any further ado, do join me in welcoming Matthew Taylor. Well, thank you, Anne, and thank you all for coming uh, this evening. It's, um, uh, it's impossible to do a speech um, at this particular moment in the sporting calendar without um, being tempted uh, with footballing metaphors. Um, I thought, should I do a Brazilian speech? Uh, exhilarating and heartwarming, but somehow failing to live up to expectations. A German speech, focused, impactful, but somehow strangely joyless. Um, a Dutch speech, basically pretty dull until the surprise ending. Um, an Argentinian speech, rather pedestrian and predictable, apart from the brilliant messy bit. Um, thank you. Uh, but hopefully my speech won't be depressing, frustrating, and leaving you embarrassed that you even hoped it would be good. It won't be an England uh, speech. Um, also, people might be slightly worried by the amount of paper in my hand as I walk to the lectern. This is because I have an answer to the riddle, what happens when failing eyesight meets unfailing vanity? The answer to that question is 36-point typeface. Um, uh, I, they, I, I may still have to revert to my glasses. Uh, the RSA has always been a progressive organisation. We've been around for 260 years, and as the world has changed many times over, so has our account of progress and the contribution that we might make to it. Tonight I'm speaking to the latest account, a new worldview and mission. We call it the power to create. My argument is that we are at the cusp of an unprecedented opportunity. Powerful social and technological change means that we can now realistically commit to the aspiration that every citizen should live a creative life. But this major step in human progress will not happen unless we're able to identify and to seek to remove the high barriers that currently stand in its way. So what do I mean by a creative life? Creativity is a slippery concept. The first definition offered by Google is the use of imagination or new ideas to create something. Not only is this obviously circular, but it begs the question, what is the something that has to be created to count as creativity? 
For some people, it's a quality belonging to certain activities, art, culture, design. Indeed, the RSA argues strongly for the links between cultural flourishing and social and economic progress. In this very room this afternoon, an hour ago, we held the first RSA Academy's Arts Day. Um, arguably, it was a stronger testament to the power to create than anything that I'll be saying in the next 25 minutes. For others, the concept of creativity can be emptied of virtue, as in creative accounting, or the job title given to people who use their undoubted talents to dream up advertising slogans. But whilst we can't all make the contribution of artists or the income of advertising executives, there's one thing to which we can all aspire to live creative lives, lives of which we are the author, lives which allow us to be the best people we can be. What does such an aspiration mean for our opportunities and responsibilities? How does it differ from the social democratic emphasis on equality or the liberal rights on freedom? Led by the work of my colleague Adam Lent, we have debated this fiercely amongst ourselves at the RSA. And if the power to create gains any traction, we would welcome a wider debate. But let me give you my version tonight to be going on with. The first aspect of the creative life is individual freedom. As liberals say, as long as we're not directly inhibiting others, we should be able to think our own thoughts, use our own words, and make our own decisions. But as Amartya Sen and others have argued, creative freedom also involves resources. We talk about how savings, or educational qualifications, or time give us the freedom to pursue our choices. And we use a third idea of freedom. This refers to our capabilities, our dispositions. We talk about people being free of drugs, free of mental illness, free from a narrow or fundamentalist worldview. Do we have the knowledge, attitude, temperament to be free? Freedom makes the creative life possible, but our choices determine whether we fulfill that possibility. It's not a state that can be achieved, but a continuous process of building a life which is unique and meaningful. Chinese artist Ai Weiwei says, Creativity is the power to act. So, prizing creativity means honoring the individual, but we must never imagine that a creative life can be realized apart from our existence as social beings. As Richard Rorty has written, we are only individuals in as much as we are social. None of us has a self to be faithful to except the one which has been cobbled together in interchanges with parents, siblings, friends, enemies, churches and governments. Our creations, a business, an artistic performance, a social movement, a product, a service, an idea, simply an act of generosity, are only possible because of the people around us. It's not just individuals that we describe as being more or less creative, but organizations, places, societies. We think of creativity being the fount of high culture, but culture, in the broader sense of the values, expectations, and norms that pervade state, market, and community, are critical determinants of a society's creative capacity. To see the creative life as a substantive virtue urges our commitment to a society in which this life is realistically attainable, not just for ourselves, but for our fellow citizens. And the power to create combines an idealistic view of human flourishing with democratic inclusiveness. As Roberto Unger said last year on this stage, the true goal of progressives must be now, as it was in the 19th century, a larger life for the ordinary man and woman. Yet from Aristotle to the Victorians, philosophers and social commentators, with an ambitious, high-minded idea of the good life well lived, have also tended to be elitists assuming that such an ideal was beyond the capabilities of the masses. But all human beings have the capacity to be the authors of their own lives. Meaning-making is what marks us out as a species. We are born with the muscles for creativity, muscles that grow with the exercise of self-determination. In short, the power to create asserts that all citizens can and should live creative lives. So this is our vision. Is there any reason to believe the power to create is anything other than a distant aspiration, a star to navigate by, but not yet a road to follow? We believe that there is. We believe we're reaching a tipping point at which the possibility of and the need for a creative citizenry looms before us and presents us with urgent choices. This moment of inflection is the result of a set of interconnected changes leading to a step change in both the demand for and supply of creativity in modern society. 
The first changes are around human capability and appetite. In all our breast beating about the failings of our education system, we can forget just how much more educated today's citizens are. In less than two generations, we've gone from under 10% to almost half of young people experiencing higher education. We might lag behind other countries in some areas, but our young people are among the best in the world when it comes to problem solving. Despite the many pressures they face, today's young people are critiquing narrow materialism in arguably a more nuanced and concrete way than their grandparents attempted in the 60s. RSA research shows more young people than ever before wanting the autonomy of owning their own business, even though the returns and security are often lower than a traditional job. Among those opting for employment, a growing proportion say they make decisions influenced by the values and ethical practices of employers. And as consumers too, young people are at the forefront of an emerging sharing economy. More broadly, a set of intertwined factors including rising affluence, a decline in the importance of tradition and deference, exposure of modern citizens through travel, immigration and the media to different cultures are all leading to more people in the developed world aspiring to what the World Values Survey calls self-expression. Technology is the second great engine of change. In its wake, many barriers to creative expression and enterprise have come tumbling down. The internet has led to a quantum leap in affordable, easy access to key tools of creativity, learning, communicating, trading, collaborating. Its pioneers thought the World Wide Web would be primarily a tool for the exchange of information among, amongst experts. But when the financial and other costs of generating and sharing content started to fall, a massive global appetite was revealed. In music, films, photographs, blogs, apps, social networks, hundreds of millions of people generating content, the overwhelming majority of it for free. As part of my ongoing midlife crisis, I'm teaching myself the guitar. For every time I try to master a tune, there are about 20 free tutorials on offer on YouTube. Following in the footsteps of pioneers like Wikipedia and Linux, again and again the creation of new, free or inexpensive, easy to use platforms have released waves of human creativity, entrepreneurial aspiration, collaborative endeavour. For example, new innovation platforms like Innocentive, inviting people to design and invent solutions to big challenges. Etsy has opened up the world's markets to craft workers. Kickstarter provides access to capital to innovators of every kind and is encouraging more people to become active, engaged investors in other people's creative ideas. Fast-growing platform Patreon enables people to invest in their favourite up-and-coming artists. Peer-to-peer -peer and sharing economy platforms for the social enterprises like Freecycle and Streetbank or commercial like Airbnb enable anyone to trade or exchange, blurring the boundaries between buyer and seller, profit-making and sharing. And human trust and reciprocity is as important as digital algorithms to the success of these platforms. Now, in our wonderment at the pace of innovation, we must resist technological determinism. The internet of invention and cultural self-expression is also the internet of porn, hate and trivia. Technology can and is sometimes used to reduce autonomy and dull creativity. Indeed, as technology becomes ever more central to our identities, we need to have a much more explicitly political debate about who controls it and for what purpose. Nevertheless, in aggregate, across a wide spectrum of human activity, greater creativity is being enabled and encouraged. The network economics are exponential. The demand for creativity drives supply, the supply of creativity drives demand, and new platforms drive both. And the impact has barely even begun. The first generation for whom it's been part of the fabric of their entire lives are now reaching adulthood. The social web, pervasive not just in terms of connectivity, but it's an intrinsic part of modern identity. It will change the town hall, white halls, schools, business, social enterprises, international relations in ways, ways we cannot yet conceive, let alone adapt to. In short, the internet has the capacity to be the most powerful accelerator of creativity in human history. Also, the relationship between creativity on and offline is unpredictable but largely positive. The music industry feared downloading would obliterate its profits. Instead, it's transformed its business model. We consume much, much more music. I'm old enough to remember when you used to go into a particular room in the house to listen to music. Now people listen to music everywhere. There are probably people in this room already listening to music. <laughs> uh, people who used to just listen to music are now much more likely to, to spend their money being part of the experience at concerts and festivals. From computer-aided design to making technologies like 3D printing, new technologies making it easier and easier to turn ideas into material products. All around the world, people are using the net to seek out new routes to personal development, connection and self-expression. And it turns out that we need this appetite. 
The new demands we make on citizens represent the third trend that could take us to a creativity tipping point. Take the CBI's definition of employability. They say it's the ability to work in a team, a willingness to demonstrate initiative and original thought, self-discipline in starting and completing tasks. Various factors, including the accelerating pace of change in markets, the need for continuous innovation, the expectation of a more personalized service, the growing appetite for authenticity in products and services, all of these things increase the premium on the capacity of employees to be created and self-motivated creative and self-motivated. And in the search for new insights and products, more companies are also acknowledging and encouraging consumer-led innovation. The rise of intelligent robots has led pessimistic and optimistic commentators to predict respectively either massive unemployment or a world of leisure. But as you will all know, such predictions have been made and confounded before. A more likely, out likely outcome is a further restructuring of labour markets and market values with consumers and service users putting a greater premium on the creative, effective touches that only human engagement can bring. Let the robots do the robotic work, let humans flourish creatively. And increasingly, the government too wants creative citizens. The mid-20th century model of industrial production, Fordism as it's sometimes called, emphasised standardised forms of mass production delivered through large centralised organisation. The modern welfare state was built on largely the same principles. But as the weaknesses of that model emerged, as many social needs have grown or become more intractable, as economic crises have spawned waves of austerity, we've come to see that the model of a paternalistic state delivering uniform services to a passive, undifferentiated citizenry is neither progressive nor practical. Conservative local authorities might refer to the big society, Labour wants the idea of the cooperative council, but whatever the label, forward-thinking public agencies, and there are still too few, are reaching a radical conclusion. Their citizens and communities are not just bundles of need, they are also huge untapped assets. Using ethnography, ethnography, public engagement, social network analysis, agencies are trying to understand those assets and how they can be mobilised. Methods of co-design and co-delivery are being pursued, blurring the boundary between professional and client. A whole set of initiatives like home share and shared lives are modern examples of an old ideal, reciprocal civic relationships, offering an alternative and adjunct to public services. Encouraged by the principle of payment by results, there's a massive growth in social enterprise. And the world of policy and service innovation, which used to be largely closed, is now open by big data, with potentially anyone with the time and inclination able to spot trends, test hypotheses, develop solutions. Of course, huge challenges like caring for an ageing population, tackling inequality and particularly responding to climate change require concerted action at national, local and international level. But our strategies will also require an adaptive and creative citizenry with the skills and confidence to develop its own solutions. So, a better educated, more self-expressive population, the impact of technology, the demand for new attributes in workers and citizens, these are all factors taking us towards a society in which we can hope to live what Unger called a larger life. But the potential tipping point might not be reached because there is another side to this story, the barriers to a society of creative possibility. Let me describe a couple of those. Culture has a vital and independent significance. And this is the first barrier. In our culture, the idea that everyone can and should live creatively is not yet accepted as an aspiration, let alone a practical imperative. We can see this, for example, in the relatively low priority given to autonomy, engagement and motivation in assessing the value of education and employment. 43% of the workforce, 13 million people in the UK, report that they aren't using their potential and skills at work. It's not that we don't see living a creative life as a good thing, nor that anyone doesn't seem to want it for themselves. In a style reminiscent of resistance to earlier movements for improvements in universal rights or entitlements, the measures necessary to achieve greater autonomy and fulfilment for all are opposed on the implicit grounds that those at the top should be able to preserve their privileges, while the hoi polloi show no sign of wanting their lives of docile subservience to be disturbed by higher aspirations. A concrete symbol of our limited commitment to the ideal of creative lives for all is the persistence of educational privilege and intergenerational inequality. The past devouring the future, in Thomas Piketty's memorable phrase. The point is not inequality per se, but that key resources that foster creative aspirations and choices are not utilised to the maximum benefits of society as a whole. 
If we judge social progress by the scale of human creativity, extreme inequality is deeply inefficient. Take capital. Not only is it concentrated in a certain strata of the population, it's concentrated in assets like London house values that do little to expand people's creative possibilities. Study after study has shown that access to relatively small amounts of capital can have a much greater impact on people's sense of efficacy and opportunity than increases in income. Yet nearly a third of our adult population effectively has no savings at all. And one of the first casualties of austerity were policies like the Children's Trust Fund and the Savings Gateway explicitly designed to address this deficit. The idea that one class is simply by its nature bound to rule another is seen as reactionary, but the assumption that only a certain strata of people, of learners, of workers, of places can be expected to be creative endures. Whatever its implications, the most radical element of the power to create is the idea itself. For the reasons I outlined earlier, the idea that the creative life is something only for an elite is being questioned. But there's a problem. So long and so deep as that assumption held sway, it's deeply inscribed into our society's institutions. In one way or another, we spend most of our lives working in or with or sometimes against institutions. And it's their working practices, what I'm going to describe as sorting, splitting and subordinating, that present a second major barrier to the power to create. Sorting is the assumption that only a certain number of roles within an institution be, can be creative in the sense of allowing and expecting autonomy, engagement, fulfillment, and that an essential role of management is to sort posts and people into a structure with the most creative jobs at or near the top. And sorting is also a purpose for some the core purpose of our educational institutions. The ultimate goal of formal education should surely be to inculcate a love of learning and to guide young people into finding the areas in which they can most fully and successfully express themselves to the benefit of society. Instead, we have a system which prizes one set of intellectual attributes, forces young people to focus on those attributes, and then sorts them by whether or not they're deemed to possess them. Part of our creativity lies in the plurality of our social existence. A second institutional habit, splitting, involves institutions allocating people a role and separating this from the other multiple roles they occupy. We sometimes talk about the different interests of public service workers, teachers, police officers, care workers, and public service consumers, parents, citizens, clients. But teachers are parents. Police officers are citizens. Most care workers will at some time or another find themselves or a loved one needing care. And you see the same phenomenon in the private sector. Workers, whether on the factory floor, the shop counter, or in an office, are motivated by a pride in what they're producing. It's something they would happily use as well as produce, buy as well as sell. For a contrast, think of the financial services sector, where for decades workers were incentivized to sell poor products on the basis of misleading information. When the only way to cope at work is to leave your values and human sympathies at home in the morning, it's not surprising that people feel demoralized and jaded. When LSE anthropologist David Graeber published an article last year arguing that most occupations, starting with his friend the high-powered corporate lawyer, comprised what he called bullshit jobs, it went globally viral. Splitting is, a particular, is particularly prevalent in institutions displaying the final institutional habit, subordination. This was first identified by my own intellectual hero, Max Weber, bureaucracy's first and greatest analyst. He described the distinction between an institution's real-world goals and its rule-based goals. And he, he observed that organisations over time tend to subordinate the former to the latter. You can see this in corporations created and built by proud entrepreneurs, engineers, designers with a market-beating service or product, but which subsequently become obsessed by size or shareholder returns. John Kay cites ICI as a business that was highly successful while its goal was to be a world-class creator of chemicals, but which soon crashed after it changed its goal and strategy, explicitly subordinating everything to maximizing shareholder returns. And it happens also in organizations claiming to operate in the public interest. Instead of empowering their employees to reconcile the inherent tensions between short-term organizational interests and public duties, institutions tend to subordinate the latter to the former. The Police Federation provided a classic newsworthy example until a few weeks ago when it accepted in full recommendations crafted by the RSA. The moment the Fed grasped that the interests of the police must be brought into alignment with those of the public was the moment when it became possible to tap fully into the creative capacities of its staff and activists. Most large organizations are trying to grapple with these institutional habits and their impact on their capacity to recruit, retain, and motivate creative employees. 
There are many institutions, private sector organisations, charities like the Women Institute, Women's Institute or the Scouts, which have shown the willingness to think in work and work in different, more creative ways. But there are too few examples, and this is because the systems that drive institutions, from financial markets to government funding regimes, are still as likely to incentivise the wrong practices as the right ones. Exclusive assumptions and organisational conventions are barriers to more people living more creatively. But what about a final, even more fundamental block? Advocates of the power to create need to have something to say about the kind of social and economic context in which creativity is most likely to be a realistic path for the most people. And given that it is a core function of government and a democracy to enable everyone to be able to participate fully in society, this final barrier takes us to the role of the state. As a goal, creative lives for all leads to a profound reconsideration of the role and working methods of government. In some areas, the state should do more than today's, in others, less. Greater activism is needed in shaping the market and its outcomes. The creative state would ensure open markets with low barriers of entry and diverse forms of ownership, encourage and enforce permissive intellectual property regimes, encourage modern employment practices, demand that utilities and essential services, including the global internet giants, are run with the public interest at heart, and they'd invest in tomorrow's infrastructure including the institutions which foster and grow innovation. As Eric Beinhocker and Nick Hanover have recently argued, the greatest achievements of capitalism lie less in economic growth or profit, but in helping find solutions to the problems that matter to us. Now we need a new partnership, not mountains of regulation, but genuine grown-up partnership between modern government and enlightened business to help us solve the problem of people locked out of the possibility of a creative life. On the other hand, the governors of the state, particularly the central state, need to be aware that its scale, complexity and accountability often make it badly suited to human scale interventions. The pace of change and growing interdependencies of the modern world mean that more policy challenges, youth unemployment, meeting care needs, are highly complex. Today's citizens aspiring to greater self-determination want a state that enables them to feel self-reliant, not one which creates and reinforces dependency. At the RSA, we work with the principle of social productivity, which is that public sector interventions should be judged by the degree to which they enable people to better contribute to meeting their own needs. The Creative Society would also, of course, seek to devolve power to the lowest level, lowest effective level, not just because the centre is too distant, but because we would encourage places to do things in substantively different ways, not just experiments in service delivery, but experiments in place shaping, indeed experiments in living. More profoundly, the values and analysis behind the power to create encourage a questioning of the very idea of traditional policymaking. The success of most social policy interventions, the interventions that draw upon and foster public creativity, rely on what academic and former Canadian Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary Jocelyn Bourgoin calls civic effects. That is public engagement, public mobilisation, behaviour change. But these civic effects are much more likely to emerge from political leaders articulating a clear vision, convening new conversations and collaborations, leading by doing, than through the slow, cumbersome process of developing and implementing policy. When it comes to social policy, politicians and managers need to replace the blunt tools of policy making with those of design, in which continuous experimentation, learning by failing, co-producing with consumers and users is the norm. And this, of course, has major implications for our systems of lawmaking and accountability. A few months ago, I sent a very early version of this speech, nearly all of which has been long since discarded, to my old friend, the writer and social innovator, Charles Zedbeter. In his diplomatic but painfully frank response, uh, he used a phrase that stuck in my mind. Having studied private, public and third sector organisations for many years, Charlie has concluded that the most effective comprise, in his words, creative communities with a cause. Nicely for us, this echoes and develops the view of a previous RSA chair, Charles Handy, who said, a good business is a community with a purpose. The road to a more creative society will be crazy paved, with changes large and small. But that road will only be laid because our society as a whole believes in progress. For what Charlie says of organisations is true of places and societies. They too must be creative communities with a cause. 
Creativity, as I have argued this evening, is an essential part of the mix, but it does not flourish in a vacuum. Community points to the importance of an open, trusting, collaborative culture where different people with different backgrounds, values and attributes mix easily with each other. Research suggests social trust is as powerfully correlated with economic dynamism as levels of tax, regulation or education. And the idea of a cause echoes my point about the kinds of institutional and political leadership which inspires and fosters a creative citizenry. Leadership that is visionary, authentic, open, accountable in relation to goals. Whatever the following winds of change, the power to create requires a form of leadership that can restore our lost faith in social progress. The RSA guards its independence closely, but in the run-up to the general election, we'll be doing all we can to get the political parties to talk more about the possibilities of the future, the important choices we face, and most of all, the kind of leadership we need and deserve. The impact of the RSA's mission, power to create, does not lie in a definition, a statement, or sadly for me, a speech. It will depend on the focused ideas and action of this great society. Looking back through our history, from the country's first public art exhibition in the 18th century, to arguing for children to go to school rather than up chimneys in the 19th century, to creating vocational qualifications in the 20th century, the RSA has always been in the business of expanding the power to create. But we've only ever made a difference by reaching out. These are not ideas we claim to own or want to protect, but something to share and grow. So whether you're an active RSA fellow or someone whose only involvement has been watching an online lecture, my invitation to you is to help us develop our ideas and their practical applications. Help us to make the RSA the kind of institution that exemplifies the power to create. Thank you. Well, thank you, Matthew, for keeping us so ably and fluently from the football this evening. Not till nine. Not till nine. Well, there you go. Well, I, wouldn't, so, I wouldn't have competed with the football. I would have lost. Matthew always says I, I quote Kant whenever I'm sort of stuck for something to say. And as Kant would say, well, the great goods can live together. <laughs> the RSA and football on one night. Um, very struck by the way that your quote from Roberto Ongo and what you drew out of it, a larger life for the ordinary man and woman, how closely that reflected Goethe's great enlightenment sort of pitch, not only, I think, for the high culture you know, in which he excelled, but for an understanding of the creative drive. And in a sense, we have sort of lost some of that, haven't we, since the, the, the late 18th century. And indeed, you know, look, look around here and there's so many traces of that. I suppose mean, you can't give us 200 years or more of, of history, but if we have lost it, why do you think that is and where might we look immediately to sort of regain that impulse? Is it politicians? Is it the state? Is it people who are involved perhaps in shaping the market? So is it something else? So I think it's a mixture of uh, historic contingency and ideology. That is to say, I think in the 20th century, big worked. Uh, I think we had a world in which big worked and in those kind of big organizations, there wasn't such a need for creativity. Um, uh, the 1950s was a time of enormous confidence in huge bureaucracies, whether in the private sector or the public sector. And arguably, they didn't do that badly. I mean, in the end, they ran out of road, as we know, in the 70s. But so on the one hand, at a time of greater stability, a slower pace of change, more deferential citizens, that kind of stuff worked. Uh, and if it was still working, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be making this speech. I also think, however, that ideology plays a part, because whilst there's virtually nothing in my speech, I'm sure that people on the kind of thoughtful wing of the political parties would disagree with. The fact of the matter is that on the left, in the end, people care more, most about equality. And equality drives a particular kind of idea of yeah. the way you organize society. And it does drive you towards notions of uniformity. It does drive you towards paternalism. And on the right, there's an idea of freedom provided simply by markets, which, as we know, is a model which does not uh, facilitate the creativity of those who do not succeed in that marketplace. So both of these ideologies 
also take you away from creativity. And so I think that combination of what worked and of ideology is why it is that, that stuff which is obvious and which is, as you say, completely recognisable to Enlightenment thinkers um, has, has, feels fresh. There's a quote, seeing as you uh, got me to chair tonight, I thought, gets the woman in for The Economist, and then he puts this in the speech. Greater activism is needed in shaping the market and its outcomes. Dear God, we spend all week trying to say, please don't do that. Um, but it does throw up, regardless of what, what one's view might, might be about the, the relative role of state and a market. It does throw up a bit of a question, I, and I suppose my eyebrows were most raised by the idea that this creative state would do all sorts of things. You know, it would have permissive intellectual property regimes, it would tell internet companies what to do. It would, in a way, define what was good for us. And I, is there a danger that, that if you define too tightly what you think a creative agenda is, with the best intentions, that you can very easily end up with a quick route back to basically other people deciding what is the good life? for you or for me. So I'm really glad you asked that question because I was going to put in loads more paragraphs at that point of the speech to, to defend myself from that attack, so you now enable me to do it. Um, the, the point is this. Um, it, it relates to what I said later in the speech. Uh, I think we've got to be very careful about policy and regulation because I think, generally speaking, it doesn't work. Uh, I think it's too slow, it's too cumbersome. The world that exists when you design the regulation is completely different to the world that exists five years later when the regulation is finally implemented, etc., etc. But it also takes me to the point about institutions, because I talk to a lot of business leaders, particularly on the issue of, issue of sustainability, and what they talk about is a kind of institutional breakdown, because they, in their businesses, want to make change happen, and they're trying to make change happen. But they know that they cannot achieve change at the system level, and they need a partnership with government to achieve a system level. And then I say to them, but why is it that your trade associations or your peak organisations don't kind of say that? And they say, well, that's because their job is to kind of tell us what we want to hear. So, actually, most business people I speak to understand that you need a partnership between government and enlightened business. It shouldn't be regulation-based. It should be based, actually, on what consumers themselves and citizens themselves want. Uh, but we have a kind of institutional structure which makes it incredibly difficult for that kind of intelligent conversation to take place. Um, so, you know, if I could, if I could be uh, in the business of institution creating, I'd love to create a new organisation that represents business, but actually tells the truth about what business people really feel, rather than panders to a kind of mass mentality that says, well, businesses are opposed to all regulation. When you and I both know, when you talk to business leaders, they recognise that wise regulation is necessary. Yes, although I think they're often wary of opening up a Pandora's box and getting more than they bargained for. Uh, what about this idea? I mean, there is a, a, a wonderful sense of, of sort of can-do and optimism, which I, I think is just marvellous to kind of put into this debate, because I think, as you rightly define, there is a sort of a what-can-you-do sense sometimes. You know, it often pulls against a lot of innovation that is actually happening, a lot of social improvement that is actually happening, but there are also areas in which it isn't. Something that we've sort of tussled with, and I think really is still, you know, the jury is very much out on, is whether sort of zero marginal cost and the availability of, you talked about music, uh, downloading, streaming, the availability cheaply of creative products that used to be very highly priced, or at least could attract a sort of market price that you could then protect. Now, this is marvellous, isn't it, if you just want to get to a lot of stuff. But it is not clear, really, whether this kills off some of the very creativity that it presents us with because we expect it all for nothing. And I wondered if you'd looked a bit at the economics of that. Yeah, and there's a lot of work on that, and I think it's a difficult debate. Uh, I sympathise with those people who used to make a lot more money out of content than it's possible now to make money out of content. They can join the kind of ranks of coal miners and slide rule manufacturers and other people who've seen the world move on and their, their kind of monopoly challenge. And I, I, I mean, that sounds flip, but, you know, it was a tragedy for all those people. When the world changes, technology changes, it has victims. And nevertheless... Uh, you know, are there more people making music? Yes. Are there more people writing? Yes. You know, are there more people uh, wanting to create stuff? Yes, there are. And I think what will happen, and what we're already starting to see, is just, as I put, said in my speech, different business models. And I think, you know, not everything is like music, but I, I, you know, I suspect that the modern author will make less money from the written word and more money from going out and talking about their book. You know, just as a modern band makes more money from festivals and, and concerts than it does from... Uh, what it records. So I think people, different business models will emerge. It may well be that creativity is something which is harder to make money out of, but that doesn't seem to stop people wanting to do it, to be honest. Yes, and that's what you want to facilitate. I was going to say, also, if you, uh, if you put everything, as we do, within sort of economic sort of a 
brackets, because that's sort of really what we're, we're there to, to do with the economists, you can end up looking at creativity purely as Bamel's cost disease on the one hand and zero marginal cost on the other. You stagger from one affliction to another, and I think it's very good. You're, you're pointing out that so many more people genuinely do seem to be enthused and want to take part I in do it. And, and the, as I say, the overwhelming majority do it for free. Like you and the guitar. Right, let's have some questions. I thought we'd take a bunch of questions in twos or threes, if we could, just so we could get a nice spread. There's all sorts of rules about questions. It, it seems to boil down to kind of speaking to the microphone. You'd never have guessed, would you? Uh, which will be roving around. It's always nice for me to know and everyone else to know who you are. Um, and I think there are some people moderating the discussion on Twitter here, so we might somehow be able to feed in those questions, because that's always... Nice to do. I could see a hand. So, uh, yes, just please introduce yourself. Um, so, I'm Andrea Siodmok, um, head of the policy lab at the Cabinet Office. Um, and it was a fantastic speech. Um, there's lots for us to think about at the uh, policy end. Um, but I'm struck by your, I guess, uh, point about the role of creative capital, if you like. Um, i.e. What, what are we trying to create? So for me, my question would be about leadership. If, if communities need a cause, in the old days, maybe it was a kind of race to outer space. Um, I'd be really interested in your views on, on the, sh the nature of leadership in this creative um, community. Mm. Great, thank you very much. Let's take another one to go along with that. Anything else? Thank you, gentlemen. The, the third row to sorry, I'm pointing that way. You look like spectacles, which doesn't help. Hello, um, I'm Ismael, CEO of the Edora Foundation. I found your vision incredibly convergent uh, with my thinking, and the question I wanted to ask is whether, if this huge shift in civilization has these convergent characteristics, does it not assume a kind of implicate order, an order that is already coded into this and that is emerging, that nobody is controlling centrally? And if that's the case, I love this notion of shifting policy from policy framework to iterative design processes. Uh, my intuition is that the way we arrive and the way we facilitate this is through emergence, and we have to develop the skills to elicit and recognize consensus patterns. What are the bits that, put, that are bringing all this together? And then government becomes an enabler of what is elicited. And I wonder whether that rings any bells in your thinking. Slightly interlinked questions there. So take yeah, them they're, 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 order. They're, they're fantastic questions. And I, I completely and I kind of agree with the import of both of them. So, so I, this is the point at which I unveil my favorite kind of leadership um, contrast. Um, and, and the point about this contrast is that it compares a way of thinking about the world which is policy driven which failed, with a way of thinking about the world which is to do with public engagement and which succeeded. And it also tells you that actually what matters is probably a sense of efficacy, a sense of being able to make a difference rather than the difference that you're making. That's the first point. So on the one hand, you have the tragedy of Labour's commitment to the abolition of child poverty. And on the other hand, you have the success of the mayor of Oklahoma in having a kind of fat-busting um, uh, crusade uh, in his city. In the first account, Tony Blair goes out and says, we're going to abolish child poverty, which is a fantastic thing, uh, a goal which has now been abandoned. Uh, on the mayor of Oklahoma's case, he stands in front of the elephant cage at Oklahoma Zoo, and he says, I've tried to lose weight, and I've failed. And the reason I failed is because we're a fat city. And so I'm asking you, the people of Oklahoma, to help me lose weight. Um, now, in, the, in his case, for a year, the people of Oklahoma thought this was great. They loved their mayor. They loved the fact that he was trying to lose weight. And they all joined in. And, and he challenged them to lose a million pounds in weight. He later admitted he had no idea what a million pounds in weight was. But they lost a million pounds in weight. <laughs> and only then, only then did he do the things that you'd expect. He had a sales tax because he said, people are saying to me, they're trying to lose weight. And we've got no bicycle lanes. We've got no green spaces. You know how much the Americans love tax? 90% of people voted for that sales tax. And he raised another $200 million dollars in the corporate sector to improve, to green the city. Mm. And now at Cloma, it's still pretty chubby, from what I hear, but, um, <laughs> but, but it's, it's a city that loves itself. It's a city that's confident. A lot of companies move there to be headquartered. What happened to Labour, Labour's pledge uh, was this. What should have happened, if only I could have gone back, although it wouldn't make any difference because Tony Blair never, ever listened to me. Um, this is a man who only ever said he was wrong when he said he was wrong not to have listened to himself earlier. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, he, 
what he should have done is this. He should have said, I have a, a, a vision that we could abolish child poverty, but the bravest and most amazing thing we've ever done. I'm going to spend a year now around the country talking to everybody to find out whether this is real. And in a year's time, I'll come back and I'll tell you three things. One, is Britain up for it? Two, the pledges I've received from business, trade unions, churches, and most of all, poor people themselves, the stuff that they want to do. And then I'll tell you the things that we as government will do to help you, because this is something you're doing, and there's a few things we could do to help you. I'm not saying you don't need policy, but policy is an adjunct to what uh, Jocelyn Bourgoyne calls, calls civic effects. And so that model, which I know in the design lab is the kind of way you think about things, is you start with public engagement, public mobilization. You start with those emergent elements, and you may or may not need policy at the end of the process. But you, what, the problem at the moment with our political class is they start with policy and then think about mobilization. I was talking to someone who was writing a party manifesto. I said, what's your main goal? Uh, and he said, just to have fewer promises, because every manifesto has more promises than the last manifesto. The first manifesto, the Tamworth manifesto, had no promises at all. Mm -hmm. Anything else you'd like to, to, to say on the... I thought the Cabinet Office... Do you feel that deals with the Cabinet Office ladies? Question. Yeah, well, are you asking about leadership and the form well, of leadership? Just, uh, and I think it's a, form, it's, a form of leadership, yeah. it's a form of leadership that is authentic, a form of yeah. leadership that trusts people with risk, a form of leadership that says, I can't do it without mm. you, a form of leadership where, the person, where you kind of know that person could fall flat on their face if you don't help them. It's not a form yeah. of leadership that says, sit back, leave it to the experts, we've got these things called tax credits, it'll all be okay. Because however good that sounds, it means people are totally disengaged. And so a wonderful, brilliant pledge... And very little credit for it as well, because people just get yeah. entangled within the system. Uh, let's have another couple of questions. Oh, my word. Come on, the sooner you ask them, the sooner you can have a drink, basically. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's some sort of incentive. Do you see my alignment there? There's lots there's... of RSA staff here. I'll be in a lot of trouble if they don't put their hands up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> One gentleman over there. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, the industry of poverty, trying to make uh, regions and people poor is a very big business. Uh, would you do something to try and point fingers at industries that do obviously create more poverty in the world? What, what, um, which, what do you mean? Like, um, capitalism is very uh, geared up towards third world countries doing all the hard work and then selling it over here, which is an illusion of wealth of, for the uh, first world. So, I, I mean, the, I, I, the speech... It's pretty wide-ranging, and I'm not, and, and uh, it doesn't wait, it doesn't, it, it doesn't range as widely as your question. But let me let me try and an answer a kind of associated question, which is, um, I'm really taken with this point that I made in the speech, but because I speak to probably people may have missed it, which is that the, the way to understand capitalism, I think, is not that its great strength is economic growth or profit which it does obviously drive, but it, its capacity, which is remarkable, to find solutions to problems that matter to us. Actually, often, it finds those solutions working with government and on the basis of government research. I'm not sure who it is, but somebody, uh, you might know, argues that actually the most important invention of the 20th century was the washing machine in terms of transforming families, transforming lives, you know. So capitalism's greatest achievements are about solving the problems that matter to us. And uh, we should... Um, it allow capitalism to carry on doing that because it does it extremely well. But certain things, but, but at the moment, there are problems which capitalism is not helping us solve. And there's quite a lot of stuff that capitalism does, particularly in the kind of, uh, um, in a kind of financial world, which doesn't seem to be very strongly related to any kind of problems that I recognise. So uh, I think we have to recognise capitalism's genius, but we have, to work, we have to think about how it is we enable capitalism to do what it does, which is find solutions to problems that matter. But there are us. contradictions here, and one of them is, and you mentioned house prices. Now, that is something where, you know, creatives are often sort of lower paid than they could if they applied their brilliance and went off into to the markets. Not always, but in many cases, you could, could make more money. And yet, what happens if you look at London or Berlin, when you're seen as a creative hub, your house prices rise. So you can almost have the sort of the best is the enemy of the good argument here. And I wonder really whether in some ways you just have to allow for some things, you take your foot off a bit and allow some things to happen on the view that you can then, you know, people will flow elsewhere, and that that is it's the other side of the coin, sir, to what you're saying about capitalism, but it allows for perhaps a more dynamic flow where you kind of perhaps don't fight every battle. You you've choose the ones that you do fight. 
So a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I think we have got to get away from the idea that creativity is just something practiced by people in black polo neck, black polo neck shirts who live in Hoxton. You know, uh, it, uh, not that I've got anything against those people if there are any in the in the all room. All welcome if you're um, streaming this. But creativity, you know, is everywhere, and that's what that's what the local authorities, the good local authorities that we work with, are finding out. Is that is that you know, mm. the, the creative person is the bloke often on a council estate uh, or a social housing estate who manages somehow with no money uh, to get a, get a group of kids up on a Sunday morning and somehow get them to a football pitch and play a football match and has immense pride in that. And there are lots of people like that. And generally speaking, one of the set failings of the public sector is to go into deprived communities, assume there is no capacity, and kind of try and create some new bureaucratic capacity. One of the most depressing statistics, or evaluations I've seen, is the evaluation of the New Deal for communities, which is an entirely benign scheme. The evaluation is that overall it probably ended up with being less capacity in the communities it had been in than there was at the beginning, you know, which is a, a terrible thing for a well-intentioned piece of uh, a piece of policy. So, first of all, creativity, is, and secondly, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not. This is not a kind of charter for 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 for, for regulation of every aspect of. Society, it's impossible. I mean, even if you wanted to, it just doesn't work because of the complexity of the modern world. But I do think, I do think, and this is a point about leadership, I do think that when there are things which, it's a really interesting question, I addressed it in my speech two years ago, why is it that there are problems which we overwhelmingly see as a problem but we don't seem to have the will to solve, yes. right? We know that housing is a massive problem. Everyone knows it's a problem. We've known it's a problem for a long time. You've written about it a lot as being a problem. But somehow... Somewhere we don't have the capacity to say, let's find a, a solution to this problem, possibly because the solution is a longer-term solution and we want short-term solutions. Uh, so I think um, uh, I, I, agree, you know, I, agree, I agree with you, but I think that uh, we have to look at, focus on those intractable, seemingly intractable issues and ask for a different form of leadership. I just want you to note the words, I agree with you, take them and cherish them, as I am doing. Uh, who else would like? I thought I'd seen a hand over here, and it was the remind change. There's one. Was one over there's here, one. let's go this way. And, and I think there's a gentleman there, so let's take these two. Where, wherever you are first. This gentleman first, and then the man in the gloaming. Uh, Nico MacDonald, Fellow of the Society. Um, just on, I was interested in your comments about uh, the need to embrace learning by design. Uh, and uh, I'll refer you back to a piece I wrote in the RSA Journal some six years ago, looking at the where whole. It came from. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so my piece, although journalistic, was uh, what should we say, somewhat critical of the uh, embrace of design, not least by government or design thinking, as it became known, government and organisations. I think it's a very interesting debate to have in the society. One. I've had with some of the uh, former RDI masters, and you know, I would encourage that debate, but we need to not be too uncritical about it. I mean, design is just the next kind of way of thinking which may be exhausted by over-reliance of policymakers and thinkers on its potential. Um, and I say that as someone who's been involved in design for 20 plus years. Um, the, the point I wanted to, to bring up was really about the creativity. I'm very much in favour of people being creative. But I do wonder when so many social problems and other problems today are addressed, often at the level of policy and government, but often by right-thinking people, in terms of we should tax this more, you know, we should ban people from doing that, you know, we should do behaviour change, you know, which is not unrelated to design thinking, which seem to be very uncreative ways of thinking about things. And you, know, you can see that in discussions about climate change, even in discussions about health and so on that you alluded to. So I wonder how might your way of thinking present a more creative approach to some of these problems that doesn't blame people, but sees people as the solution to their problems and sees people as being a positive asset rather than a, a, you know, an externality almost on the system. Hold that thought or several thoughts and we'll take one more question from the back if we could. Yes. It seems to me that you're envisaging a society in which people are much more empowered. Um, it isn't necessarily the word creativity. It is to do with the fact that people are much more engaged. My feeling is that people would like to be and we can see that when they get the chance, they enjoy being engaged. However, um, power and wealth, and I would suspect particularly power, 
are the dominating drivers of all the organizations. I'm sure that isn't true at the RSA, but in most organizations, power is what people want. And in most relationships, power is what people want. People have sort of learnt to crave power. And I think your vision is one where you have to get people to learn that actually they, because it's to do with motivation. People are motivated by power and they are motivated by money. And that is the message they get at school and everywhere. But actually they keep finding out that there are other things that they enjoy doing which aren't to do with power and wealth. And it seems to me that you have to show them that and then that will spread virally. And there are lots of examples. I think you're, in my field is, I'm an architect, I'm interested in housing. And I think you're absolutely right. Housing could, could and should be completely different if it was approached from each individual shaping their own house, groups of people creating their own place with the power to do so. And then you'd get back to environments that were much more like the Middle Ages, much more organic, less power and money based. So anyway, that's a speech rather than a question. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. I think we've got one more question on Twitter, so perhaps uh, Matthew could synthesize these rather brave undertaking. Perfect. We've got, oh, we've got three main categories of questions on Twitter. One is, how do we get creative institutions within the curriculum? Um, one is someone frustrated with local authorities and their apparent lack of creativity. Should we be devolving um, decision making around policy making at the local level even lower than local authorities? And one is whether there are people that will be less left behind and lost in this transition. So during our talk, a young offender rang this man's doorbell. His technology was plastic covered ID, his product details. Okay, so I'll try and do all those in three minutes. Um, uh, uh, Nico, the answer to your question, my view is simple. I mean, it's a long, complicated question, but my answer is simple. We should judge um, uh, leaders not by their capacity to do things, but by their capacity to encourage us to do things. And that is a very different way of thinking about politics. Uh, I hear what you say about design. I don't think you should reify design. It seems to be what is different about design fundamentally is that it is experimental and it doesn't punish failure in the way that policy making is not experimental and does punish failure. So, you know, whether or not it's the word design, I don't know. But you know, one of the fundamental reasons, and this takes me to the second point about power, uh, you know, I think you're right, but I think that what I'm, I'm noticing is that, you know, and uh, you know, I'm sorry if this seems kind of flip, but it is certainly true that one of the things that austerity has done to certain public agencies is they've suddenly realized that there just isn't any power left. There's no power and money. They can't do it anymore. And that impels them to think in a different way because they, those tools have just broken. So I, I suspect that some of the local authorities we work with who are really thinking very hard about their communities as assets and engaging them differently just wouldn't have done it if they could have carried on splashing the cash around. But they have had to change the way they think. Now, many others are still in denial. But that really is a, a change um, uh, that we see. And then finally, just those final three questions. You know, on the curriculum, we're doing a big piece of work about uh, we have a set of academies and creativity is at the heart of that. Um, and we're actually publishing a piece of work in two or three weeks on the creative teacher. So it's something that we think about a great deal. We th I think that we, we think that creativity is one of the most sought after characteristics of people in the modern workplace and modern society, but it's yet still at the margins of how we think about learning. And I think some of the most innovative and exciting ways of learning put creativity at their heart. Um, uh, on the kind of devolution question, I completely agree. Uh, I think local authorities, I love local authorities, they do have a tendency to forget that very often the town hall is big brother uh, to many of the people who live there. So, you know, local authorities can be very, very big and very impersonal. So actually, this is not about saying that the answer to empowering people is to move power from Whitehall to town hall. It's actually about a completely different model of thinking about change. And then this point about people left being, being left behind, of, of course, is, is, is absolutely right. And, I, you know, I think in the end, you know, if people in the modern world, if people do not have motivation, they don't believe that they can change their lives, then there's actually very little that can be done. In the, you know, in the 21st century, our model of kind of looking after people who don't feel those kind of attributes is running out of road. And so we offer a false prospectus to people. We have to say we have a, a society which is there and repeatedly offers people the opportunities to be masters of their own masters and mistresses of their own fate. 
but the kind of contract which said, you know, don't worry, look, sit back and we'll do it for you. Well, there's not a person under 25 who thinks that's true anymore because they are living with the reality that it's not true. So let's make a rich and generous offer to people across society, but let's make that offer realistic and let's make that offer about how they become the authors of their own lives. Well, well, well done. Without hesitation, deviation or repetition and all in it. Yeah, and you, well, a bit more than three minutes, but th 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 that is allowed on an evening like this. Uh, I think, as Matthew mentioned, this is very much the start of a conversation that you're going to be having with the RSA and bringing uh, people in to continue it over talks and debates in the coming months. They start on Thursday lunchtime with a panel of senior RSA people exploring what power to create might mean for their sectors and they include institutional reform, public services, sustainable enterprise and design. So whatever your thing is, there should really be someone at least that you can halfway agree with. Do come along and, or listen online if you're unable to do that via the RSA website. It is most definitely time for a glass of something cooling. So let us go down to the Benjamin Franklin room on the ground floor. Immediately below us, where this will be on offer. But before we raise our glasses, I think, you, could you please metaphorically raise your glass and a round of applause for Matthew Taylor?